I am uh, François Barjo from uh, the French Institutes in uh, Denmark. And I'm delighted in the name of the French Institute. We are delighted to host the upcoming conversation on uh, digital democracy. As part uh, of uh, Novembre Numérique, the festival of uh, the French Institutes, which celebrates the digital uh, culture. Tonight with us to participate in this debate online, we are very happy to welcome uh, Albert Rogien and uh, Nils Ivar Larsen. Thank you for inviting us. You're very welcome. Uh, Albert Rogien, uh, you are a French sociologist and a researcher for CNRS, the French uh, National Center for Scientific Research. And you currently work for EH2SS, uh, the School of uh, Advanced Studies uh, in the Social Sciences. For some years now, you have been working on the new forms of uh, political engagement outside the traditional political parties, among uh, other topics. You have published uh, several books. Uh, we can name the two last ones, uh, co-written with the French philosopher Sandra uh, Logier, Why Disobey in Democracy, and The Principle of Democracy, Investigation of New Forms of politics. Nils uh, Iva, uh, I guess the audience may know you already as uh, you are uh, working, you are a Danish journalist working for the Dany, daily newspaper uh, Information. That's right. And you yes. have been uh, very much involved these last uh, weeks with uh, uh, Piketty and his uh, last book, Capital Oh, yes, indeed. Yes, I translated the most of it. Yes, into yes. Danish. That's right. Yes, uh, and that's uh, way enough for me. So I will uh, now leave you the place and uh, thank you again very much for tonight. Thank you, Francois. Okay, um, and uh, and thank you for uh, joining me in this conversation, uh, dear Albert. I'm looking uh, very much forward to our conversation uh, because the topic of today is, uh, I think, one of the most um, important challenges of our time. And um, the main question could be framed uh, in, in two ways, I think. We could frame it in a defensive manner. How can we make the internet safe for democracy as we know it? Or we could frame it more ambitiously how can we use the internet to improve or even to uh, completely reinvent democracy, making it more participatory, more inclusive, more enlightened and uh, more transparent. So I'm very keen on, on hearing your thoughts and I do hope that you can give us uh, some cause for optimism. Because uh, in uh, contrast to uh, the days in, back in the 90s when the internet was a, a brand new thing and a promising invention by free and loving American hippies. Uh, um, there are not a lot of, of cyber utopians around anymore. Uh, on the contrary, there are a lot of uh, uh, dystopians. Um, if you just give me a few minutes, I'll, I'll try to, uh, to present uh, the themes for the conversation. Skeptics argue that even though a cyber democracy certainly has an obvious potential of, of paving a way for a participatory democracy, there is uh, in today's world no limit to uh, sinister forces who can abuse or take advantage of uh, the modern communications technology in order to undermine the existing political system and its institutions. For instance, with digitally uh, targeted advertising that we know uh, played some role in Trump's election win and in the Brexit result. Um, as you know, critics believe that social media and its algorithms have caused a worrying decline in our democratic conversation. Instead of information carefully fact-checked by professional quality media, such as my own newspaper, where people today are fed with only the kind of information that confirm their favorite prejudices. So there is a, a worrying breakdown of truth norms that uh, tends to destroy meaningful debate. And uh, there is, in some quarters, an in invasion of fake news. 
So uh, this sorry state of affairs, uh, that is a widely shared analysis, uh, is said to be responsible for the rise of populisms and for the illiberal democracies that we can observe in several countries. So instead of bringing us together uh, because of the dominance of this new uh, digital public sphere, we are increasingly living in, in divided compartments with competing echo chambers uh, that never really meet. And one could stress this point and say that uh, never in history before have so many people communicated and yet never has a mutual comprehension across the political board been harder to achieve. So uh, I must confess that I'm a, a little less uh, optimistic than you seem to be. Uh, I think uh, it might take uh, us decades uh, to work out this challenge. Um, in a way, you could argue that we are living in a new uh, Gutenberg uh, moment. The old parliamentarian representative democracy uh, may be dying, while we may see the contours of a new participatory cyber democracy emerging in some places, but it is certainly not uh, born yet. The uh, expansion of, of the social media bubbles uh, could very well, I fear, hasten the demise of the old system without giving us a new and more sustainable one instead. So I think that we should not be uh, too complacent about it and we should remember the first Gutenberg moment. We should remember uh, that we didn't uh, jump directly from, from printed leaflets to trusted newspapers in one generation. The revolutions that were ushered in by the printing press, they were not peaceful uh, and bloodless. And perhaps there is a lesson here that we uh, should, should heed. Um, this may, of course, sound a little alarmistic, and I do not think we are heading towards a new 30 years uh, war, or not even a low intensive civil war in the US, even though some people actually do fear that nowadays. Anyway, I, of course, I would like to know your thoughts on, on these concerns, but rather than addressing this question head on, I think we should start somewhere else. When the word crisis is written in Chinese, it is composed of two characters, and the one represents uh, danger and the other represents opportunity. So if our new communications technology has fostered a, a degradation of the public sphere and a democracy crisis, you could also make the point, as I know that you do, that in fact, democracy was already in crisis and has been so for decades. Our representarian parliamentarian uh, democracy has ossified in a form going back to the early 20th century. So if you could please elaborate, why is it according to your analysis that the democratic instruments that once worked and gave us great things such as the welfare state, they no longer work today? What lies behind this uh, democratic disenchantment and the uh, illusion on behalf of democracy that we can see in, in the dramatic decline of, of party membership, for instance? Well, you ask so many questions and, and it's all <laughs> also alarmistic what you say um, about the crisis. Uh, I will try to be more optimistic, a little bit more optimistic, or to show the optimistic side of, of this affair. Uh, answering the last question, um, we must go back to the aftermath of Second World War, not take the entire 20th century uh, as, as an entity, but what happened after Second World War, the type of international organization and, and what we shall call the era of human rights or a democracy based on human rights, on defense of human rights. So this is, we have a span of time, which is 70 years from the end of the war mm -hmm. until now. And it's this span of time I, I would consider. Uh, probably after the war, the positions of right and left were quite clear. And you had these big, called cartel parties, uh, parties of government, one yeah. 
major party of right, one major party of the left, and you have yeah, center left, center right, social democrats and Christian democrats, and yeah, social yes. democrats and yes. Christian democrats, mm -hmm. and each time you have a change, uh, and elections at this meaning of changing a government when you do not accept what they do. So you have one vote in right, one vote at the left. This system uh, lasted for, let's say, 40 years until you had this, at the same time, a nazification, just as you said, of the system, which got more and more professional. And the people, that represented uh, the people, the elected persons, uh, turned to be professionals, uh, and yeah. an entire set of new uh, skills uh, enabling, allowing to win the elections uh, were created. S statistics, marketing, uh, yeah, fo focus groups, yes. Focus groups, yeah. Yeah. name it, you have it. And suddenly politics uh, turned to be a very professional matter. Um, and this is one reason for me that, that people could not recognize themselves in what these professionals were saying. This is one reason it is ossification, institutionalization, 40 years of of professional politics and leaving aside the people. This is one reason, long process of ossification or institutionalization, professionalization of politics, yeah. which puts the people aside. And the technocrats are in charge. And, and meanwhile, <laughs> technocrats yeah. are in charge, uh, which is not a new phenomenon, but let's put that aside because before the war, Technocrats were also in charge, but let's. <laughs> this is a new, a, a new regime of technocratic uh, politics. Uh, this is one reason. The other reason is, as you know, the change in economic in economics, which is neoliberalism, uh, is a direct assault against the state. And the state has to recede, leaving to the market the organization of societies. You, if you see what I mean. Absolutely, so, yes. The, yeah. the, the, the other side of the coin is that politicians stop, they stopped uh, believing in the state as something that should change positively the lives of the people. Yes. This is an epoch that Thomas Piketty calls uh, the new proprietorist uh, epoch the one we are living now and have been living in since Reagan and Thatcher's conservative right. revolutions. He yeah. is right. So mm -hmm. as the state was put aside, uh, what should politicians do to offer to the people? That's why the, the programs of these huge big parties were so void of, of any proposal. Uh, and also, you couldn't uh, raise the standards of living of the people, since there is a problem with the debt, and we had to get back the money we took. <laughs> and all the social democrats, or all what was called the social state, uh, vanished bit by bit. Less yeah. and less money, more and more taxes uh, on the people, less and less taxes on the rich. Okay, so this is another point that politicians on one side, they get professionalized and then yeah. suddenly they couldn't get back to the people what they demanded. So this is a problem. Uh, and also there's, of course, uh, globalization and, and uh, the tax competition. Yeah, it uh, comes, it, it, yeah. in, my, in, my, in my head, it comes together. It's because of globalization that you have a, um, that the state recedes and, and leaves the room to the market. It goes end in end. So uh, where do we stand? Then comes the will of the people to express themselves, to have demands addressed to the state, to get 
a better kind of, 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 of life, let's say. Also, the, the problem of, of um, uh, the, 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 uh, the work, the showman, yeah. um, the, the economic crisis. Chômage, yes. It's, it's uh, the chômage. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I know what you mean. <laughs> uh, unemploy, <laughs> unemployment. Unemployment, yes. Un un unemployment, yeah. of course. Un yeah. unemployment. Uh, which co this comes together globalization, the, uh, neoliberalism, and unemployment. It's the same movement, but it leaves the politicians with no instruments to, to, to please the people. So comes in now, the parties have no discourse to address to the people and comes in internet. What is internet? Internet is, in the, uh, is the possibility given to the people to express their demands and to make it in a very open and uh, horizontal way. It gives them the opportunity to to express or formulate demands that the parties do not express and do not formulate any longer in parliaments, for example. So you have on, on one side a parliament which tends to be devoid of any solutions or any capacity to fulfill the demands of the people and people organizing themselves to express and formulate these demands which the parliament or parliamentarians or politicians know they can't fulfill. But this is the, the best place where internet comes in, organizing the voices of those who have no voice any longer in the, in the representative system. And yes. But this is not just one cause of, of the regress of uh, parliamentarism or representative democracy. You have to take the three uh, together to understand a little bit what's, what's happening. So the decline of representative democracy has these three causes. One, professionalism, ossification, neoliberalism, and the organization of the people by themselves to express demands that can't be fulfilled by the parliament. Yes. This is in, in, in defense of, of the technocrats, uh, one could say that, um, that the overall uh, complexity of, of, uh, of governance in, in, a, in a very modern society has become so uh, great that, uh, that, that citizens are bound to delegate the tasks of, of governance to, to specialists. Um, I do not agree. No. No, I do not agree because democracy enables uh, an equilibrium between technocrats and the will of the people. So if the technocrats are let alone and they decide, it's not because the world is too complex, it's because they don't want to offer the information they have to the people and let the people decide. Hmm. Do you agree? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I, I see your point, uh, of course, but uh, um, in, in defense of the old democratic institutions, you could uh, say that they have their checks and balances. There is a, a power separations and there are very uh, clearly defined procedures about how to proceed when a bill is introduced and subsequently in, enacted into law. It can be a very uh, complicated and messy uh, business, but also it is uh, reassuring in a way because there are safeguards against uh, transgressions and, and spontaneous uh, majority despotism and, and, and arbitrariness. Uh, do you think that a, a, a more participatory cyber democracy could give us uh, similar assurances? Uh, a, participative, a participative democracy well organized would do. The point yeah. is, is do we allow such a democracy to exist? Uh, I doubt it. This, this is the point of pessimism. I doubt that the, the, the technocratic, uh, I don't want to say class, but I say class, the, the, the technocrats uh, 
yeah. will joyfully give up they are their uh, privileges and position, uh, the positions they have acquired by now through this belief they, uh, that they are the experts and, and the people could not do whatever uh, in this complex and, and difficult world with so many uh, parameters that just the experts know how, how to deal with. Um, don't, don't we see this a very conflict, in the, um, uh, sorry, uh, in, in, in the, um, the uh, conflict between uh, the Yellow West, Les Gilets Jaunes in, in France, and, and uh, the Macron's uh, technocratic uh, government in a way. I mean, the Gilets Jaunes is uh, perhaps a, a paradigmatic example of, of, uh, of how the internet can be used to, to, mo to mobilize a, a popular will. Um, well, it's uh, the major phenomenon in, in the Gilets Jaunes uh, movement is not the internet. It's the fact that they get together yeah. at these roundabouts and they stay there. <laughs> they occupy sure. the place. Well, and they have their it, they have their it, grievances, of course, but uh, they they got together because they they met on the social media uh, mostly. <laughs> Isn't that no, so? It's, no. it's not true. I, I think it's not no. true. It's you have a media representation of the movement, the Gilets Jaunes. Yeah. And the media, they they just have they need to have uh, leaders, and then knowing uh, where does it come from. Yeah. Who's the leader, who, who are the correct spokespersons and so on? Yeah. Correct spokespersons, as you say. Yeah. The, the problem is that these people gather uh, independently. It's, they gathered all over the place in France, which is one feature of the movement. It's quite surprising. Usually, when you have a revolution, uh, everybody comes to Paris and they try to yeah. occupy the Champs Elysees or go to the, the Place Elysees, de la République. Yeah. Place mm -hmm. de la République. And all, all happens in Paris. The Mouvement des Gilets Jaunes, it happens all over the place in France, all over the roundabouts. And these people, they just knew each other because they belonged to the place where they occupied the roundabout. It's small villages, little towns, uh, yeah. suburbs. And these people, they say, oh, there's a roundabout. I go there and I start to, to act with collectively with, with my neighbors. So this is the... The feature, the, the first and most important feature of the Gilets Jaunes is this encounter of the people on the roundabouts. And then that's why the movement never had a unique direction. And if you take the internet, you had three or four social media gathering several uh, tribes, if, if you will, uh, or, or groups of yeah. people. Uh, yeah, even though even though they they came most of them from the same class, it was a, a very uh, heterogeneous um, a lot. You could say, I mean, there were people uh, to the left, and and uh, there were people who voted uh, Le Pen, and, story, and, and so on. I don't want to tell my story of the mouvement de gilets jaunes, but you, I agree with you. It's it's quite di diverse, and yeah. um, in the. I'm sorry, the telephone. <laughs> um, Don't worry. And, and, and in, the, in the, the year that it lasted, the movement, it changed from an extreme, extreme right movement to an extreme left movement. It's a, a change in the political orientation of, the, of what we shall call a movement. Though there there's no movements, there are different fractions and they fought one against the other inside the movement to take the lead of uh, the movement. Okay, uh, in the beginning it was very close to the National Front, extreme mm -hmm. right, and, and in, after let's say two months there was a fight inside and it, the extreme right was defeated and the left and extreme left took the lead. 
But I won't, yeah. uh, I won't tell all the story. It's, it's my oh. story and it's my narrative, as you say. Okay. Uh, I, I'd like to know I more think... about that uh, some other time, but if you do not consider it a paradigmatic example of, a, of a, an internet uh, um, uh, generated movement, perhaps we should, should not uh, go too much uh, deep into it. No, what, uh, but, the, but it was an example of democratic empowerment. Yeah, yeah. Let sorry. Let yes. me tell you that the movement is quite interesting in regard of the use of internet. It shows that the internet is not only fake news and extreme right position. It can be yeah. also on the other side of, but usually we do not consider that the internet is a place where the left expresses itself. It's always a danger because we believe it's fascist, the fascist sphere. Yeah. Yes. Just deal with the internet but it's wrong it's just wrong barack obama was the first it's said in the history that he is the first one who understood the use of internet and that's why he won the election in 2008 and, and, and in the curve in the course of time extreme rights learned how to use the internet and use yeah. fake news uh, phenomenon to just divert people and, and, and try to manipulate uh, elections. You never, we, no one must believe that it's only on the extreme right and for the sake of fake news that the internet is used. It is used on the other side too. And yes. Very funnily uh, or surprisingly, we very seldom say this other side of, of uh, I mean, the organization and, and the Gilets Jaunes, one, one uh, part of the movement get org got organized uh, around the social media on the left program yeah. and use and the, the extreme right side of the movement on the internet faded away. Can you mention any uh, other obvious examples of, of leftist, leftist movements uh, that have um, uh, been able to, to mobilize uh, uh, while the incident? One, well, of course, thinks of the, uh, the Arab Spring, which, well, that was perhaps beyond the right or left. It was a call for a democracy, but it was a highly efficient one uh, up to a certain point because uh, th then there were any uh, leaders, the movements did not constitute any party and, and they were afterwards uh, crushed in al almost all countries except for Tunisia, of course. But um, yeah, if, if, if you can mention some other examples, uh, Los Indianados or there are many, Spain. There are many. The, the yeah. problem is when you, when you speak about in the internet, you must introduce another factor, which is the will of repression of the state. Because I could mention yeah. Russia, for example. Russia, in time of protest against Putin, mm. which is organized on the internet. I can mention Iran in two, yeah. 2009, I think. Yeah, yeah the Green Movement, yes. Yeah. Uh, what's going on in Belarus against Lukashenko? Yeah. I mean, name it, you'll have it, because it belongs to anyone, the internet. Yeah. Except in, in, one, in one situation where, it's, where the people are cut off the internet by the state. Yeah, and they, they tend to do that in, in Iran and in, in Turkey, but, but only for a short while because uh, the internet is a part of the infrastructure. So they, they I mean, they cannot what, what, what themselves do, uh, do without it. What, what would you say about China? It's not just for a, for a meanwhile. Yeah. Whether you organize your your own internet or you use it on repressive uh, intent, uh, yeah. but but the state can also. So, so the point here yes. is, what kind of state tolerates the existence of the internet as a free possibility of expression for the people? Uh, in in such a situation, we can discuss about the good and the bad of internet but yeah we never have to to uh to 
we have to forget, uh, we don't have to forget that the state can always cut it off. And uh, it's just, it, the internet, as we discuss about it, is valid just in, the, in a situation where it's open and free. Yeah, obviously. And in, in China, you see increasingly that they try to, to, to disconnect uh, their own Chinese version of the internet from, from the global one. You ask for other examples, I'll take Hong yeah. Kong. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah. And yeah. what's going to happen now is, is a control of the internet. And, yes. But also, first of all, comes repression. I mean, yeah. <laughs> put the people in jail and it's good. So, so there is a political struggle over who can control the internet, uh, the states or the people, but also the, the corporations, of course. Uh, to whom does the internet mostly belong today, to the people or to the corporations or to, to this the states? This is the, the other side of the problem. The problem is it's, it belongs to the people. As you said, the yeah. hippies started yeah. the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, uh, People realize it's Google, it's uh, Facebook, <laughs> and Twitter, and and these people just sell. <laughs> they sell. Yeah. So, what we see now is quite interesting. For example, during the last election in the states, nobody spoke about the internet. No. By, by contrast with what happened at the time of Hillary Clinton where you said, uh, everybody said it's the Russians, the Ukrainians, uh, it was manipulated by forces, black yeah. forces. <laughs> this, this, this time, nobody speaks about the internet. No, there hasn't been and such a narrative this time, that's right. Well, the other, the other, so something must have happened. Something must have happened. And if, if you follow discussions which occur now inside the Democratic Party, you notice that the young generation of the Democratic Party criticizes the older generation because they don't use internet the right way. And that's why they, they lo lost a, a couple of seats in the Congress because it's old candidates who do yeah. not know how to use the internet. So, mm -hmm. so let's just have this in mind. The other thing is what's going on, uh, the accusation of Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, and Twitter, and the will to dismantle these huge operators as, as yeah. because they represent a danger for democracy. Yeah, because they are monopolies, de facto so monopolies. They are monopolies. So yeah. this is the end of optimism, saying that a, a society is can defend themselves when they see a danger. Mm -hmm. In the 1990s, uh, the internet was uh, celebrated for giving the public uh, a newfound access to uh, information about political issues and about candidates uh, and for giving uh, unprecedented um, levels of transparency uh, for public uh, data. And it was praised for laying the groundwork for a new generation of campaigns and social movements, enabling citizens to challenge existing power structures and information gatekeepers. Um, where do you see the most uh, promising uh, recent examples? Oh, okay, we already discussed that bit. Uh, what what do you call autonomous political practices, and how do you see autonomous political practices? transforming civil society. Could, could you elaborate this on, on, this, on this concept? Oh, this is a, a very, also a very funny uh, matter. E-government, when you speak about transparency, we have to take it at the level of the government, the fact that governments put on the platforms the, all the information they use to make policies. If we agree about this, this is this yes. is the, 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 the model they offer, and, and particularly in, in Great Britain, uh, they are quite uh, in advance on this. They, they just yeah, they have the Open Information Act. Yeah, it's, it's the Open yeah. Information. So yeah, now what is the problem? The problem is for for a researcher as as I am, 
I have time to go and, and, and try to figure out what's going on in the numbers the government gives me or the information or all the decrees, all the laws, all, all the, the discussions in, in cabinets and, and whatever. Uh, ordinary people do not have that time except when they are unemployed. This is something I, I like to say, uh, because unemployment allows people to get to reach the information if they want. Yeah. If they want. Yeah. They have to just to invite them to do so. But my, my work is to do that. So I have the data the government uses to make policies and I can discuss or criticize or uh, even um, demonstrate how this data uh, make policies that are against the people, for example, in, in neoliberal terms. Uh, so these data are available, and 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 it's 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 not bad. It's 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 nice, but the problem is who uh, who takes the time go and read yeah. through all this data. Yes, yeah, they, they are not structured in, in, a, in a curated uh, manner. I mean, uh, it's, it's open, it's open. Yeah, it's, it's open, mean, but, but yeah. you, you, you need to be uh, tech savvy in order to, to search uh, and, and find uh, what you're actually looking for. Is, is that the extreme right makes good use of this data and they elaborate on this data fake news. See, see yeah. This is a report. You can't you can't say it does not exist. The government issued this report, and this is what it says. Nobody goes to see the report, and they believe. Yeah. They believe. They they listen what the fake news elaborated on this data. Yeah. So this is an, an, an opportunity given to fake news uh, producers uh, to act on the basis of something which appears to be the truth. Yes, and, and, and it's a sort of pseudo-authority, you could say. Yeah. The, the, the problem with the vaccines now on, on COVID-19, yeah. uh, the elaboration which is done in, in a very conspirationist way uh, is based on data. Uh, and they show you the data and say, see, <laughs> it was yeah. a decision made by the government to release the COVID. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so you can read that. So that's why I, I wanted just to, 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 to say that you have both sides. You have open data, people yeah. who's, who's willing, even who is willing to spend time reading through all these papers, and the use which is made actually. Uh, at the moment is, is taken in a bad way, let's, let's say. So it, it's an opportunity for democracy, uh, but when you, you get into it, you realize that it's not, uh, it's an opportunity and you, we have to um, make it grow. We have to uh, yeah. take it in our hands and make something democratic of this data, which are just open. Uh, they exist, they are given, it's true, uh, there's no lie. Uh, so, so that would be a major step in, in, um, in fostering a, a sustainable cyber democracy to, uh, to, um, to make data more uh, readily accessible uh, for everyone. And to foster a culture where, where people are getting used to looking into to data. That sometimes I say it's it's a pity that uh, work time should be divided in uh, for ordinary people should be divided into two. You work twenty hours of production and twenty hours you're free <laughs> to make politics, and then just to go and read the papers yeah. and and get acquainted with what's going on. But as long as ordinary people have to work 30, 40 hours a week. And don't, and if they want, this is the phenomenon I was studying is uh, the fact that the people uh, 
try to formulate their demands on their own, this political, the autonomous political practices. So, so it's yeah. over time, so, so, so they work, they have a family to raise, they have to get entertained, and then they have to make politics. And the technocrats, they just sit in, on, on the bench and <laughs> they have to do that the same, even yeah. 60 hours a week. So there's a huge difference in, in the, the availability of time uh, given to the one and, yes. and denied to the others. So as long as you do not give an opportunity to the people uh, to study what technocrats are studying, um, there will always be a, a balance. An, an imbalance, yes. There, there has been uh, some experiments with, uh, with you know, citizen councils uh, yes. in, in different countries, in Denmark, in Great Britain, and, and also in France to some extent. If, I don't know if you can consider Macron's uh, social dialogue uh, part of, of, of such an experiment as well. Uh, there was a cyber dimension to it, um, I think. Uh, but um, what are the kind of specific steps could you suggest could be uh, uh, taken to to empower uh, people I democratically? This conference is what we what are called in, in France. It's called uh, the Conférence Citoyenne. Yes. Uh, citizen Conference, and it's not the dialogue. Uh, Macron made this his famous uh, national debate. Yes. Uh, I mean, he, he staged himself as a leader, and, and this was... The, the, the it was more kind of a monologue, perhaps. <laughs> a monologue, a mon <laughs> Macron's yeah. monologue. But what he decided mm -hmm. after that is, is this conference is on climate, which is you take citizens, ordinary citizens, it's not only on the internet. They have to meet as a, as a parliament. Uh, yes. conference to be physically present each weekend and to work and in the meantime between the weekends when they are uh, assembled uh, somewhere in Paris they just communicate between themselves they send documents files uh, they discuss so internet has also this uh, ability this uh, opportunity to, to enable people to discuss but what's important is the fact that they are on the same spot and they have the right to decide for the government. This is what has been said. And it's not only in France. In France, it's the first time it happened that uh, people that are, um, they have no implication in, in any, of any kind in politics. Yeah, yeah are uh, put together to discuss and, del and debate on, on these problems. They have a very specific point to discuss, which is how can you reduce the pollution or the emissions? Uh... Yeah. Okay. Um, and and the, the, the delegates, they, they, they are chosen uh, in order to be uh, representative uh, of how the, the, the population is uh, yeah, in yeah. general. It's, it, it's, it's very professional, it's done very professionally and they yeah. represent far better than the parliament is representing the population. I mean, it's, it's drawn about but from statistics and, and you have all the categories of populations that, has to, that have to be represented. And also these people are in contact uh, all over the place in France with their relatives and friends and they discuss and the, the word is disseminated. And so you have this feeling and, and it, it's a very true feeling because I, it happens that I know the people who do that and I've, I, I studied the, the, the process. Uh, so nobody can say that it was uh, wrong manipulated uh, that the, the, the deliberations were uh, yeah, manipulated or, or not open uh, and, no. and no transparent. But so that's important. In France, it's quite important because the, the <laughs> on the hierarchy of democracies, France is very, very low. It's because of its system. It's, anyway, I won't discuss this. But th this happens in Great Britain, in Denmark, in, 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 in Belgium, 
Yes. Very important. All these conferences of citizens uh, who are not implied in politics and after the side take decisions and gave them uh, to the parliament to debate, uh, it's, it's spreading all over the place. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is uh, probably one of the complement to representative democracy, which deliberative democracy gives. Uh, and, and it's on, on its way. And, and nobody denies that it's right to do that. And everybody... Yes, across the political spectrum, yes. Yeah. Spain, mm -hmm. in Italy, in... Uh, I mean, wherever, just in Hungary, maybe. <laughs> in Hungary, <laughs> in, in, in Poland... Yeah, in Hungary, Hungary is, is yet, a basket yet, case, yet. of course. Not yet. Yeah. It will happen, but not yet. Yeah. At the time, people in Hungary and Poland are in the streets. And, but later, when democracy will come back, you'll see these conferences also come back to Poland and Hungary. Yes, let's hope so. Uh, one, <laughs> final, uh, one final question, if, if we still have time. Um, do, what kind of uh, specific steps could be uh, taken to prevent uh, disinformation uh, uh, from manipulating uh, citizens in, uh, in, in democratic nations? Because there's a conflict here with, with free speech, uh, I think. Uh, we, we need to tolerate some this information, who, who should be the new gatekeepers? What can uh, be, be done to give people more control over their own data? I think my point first is what I said about dismantling these big uh, data firms like uh, Google, uh, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter. Yeah, Trump. who can do that? Only, yeah. only the uh, the EU and, or the USA should have to be two very powerful uh, uh, democratic I think, institutions. I think this, is, this is one way. Uh, the other way, uh, there's another way. It's uh, because there's m money involved in all this uh, fake news uh, industry. Uh, yes, people mm. who, who diffuse uh, fake news know they're going to win, uh, earn money uh, and that's one of the reasons so if you relate the question of money if there's no money involved in uh, opening sites of fake news mm -hmm. probably most of these sites will disappear uh, anyway th th the fight against fake news is is on its way uh, i'm quite confident that the, the secret services and, and everybody around this uh, tried the cyber the police is working. I'm quite sure, uh, I don't know, I'm not studying this. I'm sure it, it happens. One uh, proof of this is what happened in the US election. Uh, if you, and the guy who was the chief of the cyber uh, control of the election that's been fired by Trump. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. He, said, he said, I heard that. It, it was the, the coolest elections we ever see. So, <laughs> I suspect that there's a work which is done uh, at a very high level because the danger to democracy of these uh, big uh, firms has been demonstrated and, and you, yeah. it's clear for every, everyone. So this is one step uh, is this control by the, by the state, which is quite difficult in, in, in the case of the US. Uh, you have the First Amendment, you know, yes. <laughs> you have yeah. free speech, so it's quite difficult, but... You, you cannot nationalize uh, Facebook, it, it's a global uh, corporation, but perhaps you could, um, I mean... Uh, you, 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 there's anti, uh, antitrust uh, policies can yeah. be led against yeah. it. And you, anyway, now, we are, we are the, uh, guilty of giving up our information to Facebook and Twitter. So why don't we yeah. stop uh, giving the information? Okay, this is another point, quite difficult also. Um, mm, yes. Uh, the other, uh, um, uh, you ask other... What, what can be done to keep more uh, people, uh, more control over their own uh, data? More control. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this, this, these are uh, our control on our, on our own data control of the state over the dangers, the biggest dangers of, of, of the internet, of the in industry of the internet. And then I think, and you are concerned, that uh, journalism should change a little bit and start... Okay, <laughs> yes, start, in, what, in what way? <laughs> start not following Twitter, 
never quoting any any sentence of yes. Twitter. Yeah. I mean, this should not exist for journalists. And no, uh, yeah. no, we are beginning to be become more or less like uh, parasites uh, on on, uh, <laughs> on Trump's uh, Trump's Twitter feed or any other politician for that matter. Yeah, um, yeah. I, 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 did, uh, I did not. Twitter itself started to censor Trump. Yes, because it's there because is some so, soul searching within true. these corporate giants themselves. Yes. Or, yes, uh, or, or, or um, CBS, I think, or, or ABC. They just cut Trump saying, uh, "Yes, uh, I won the election," and they said, "Oh, this is false." So yeah. you have, I think, uh, is it a revolution or a change on an evolution of the work of journalism? Which is, they should not only uh, address fact checking, but having another stance on what their mission is in democracy. And mm -hmm. It's quite difficult because uh, I know you have this problem, economic problems, you have to have readers. And, uh, the, the, yeah, it's uh, very hard to find a, a business model uh, being on the web, as you probably, know. Probably, I, I, no. I think one section of journalism should turn uh, as a defense of democracy squad and, uh, and yeah. feel their mission as being uh, one of, of this uh, defense of democracy. Yeah, so, some of the American media did that, you know, Washington Post had this uh, uh, slogan, uh, democracy dies in, in darkness uh, underneath their, their header. Uh, yes, but you have yeah. to it's not only uh, uh, having good information, it's, it's a fight for the principle of truth, as you may understand now, yeah. which is quite important because it started with Putin, the first guy who said, you have to, just to blur the border between truth and, and, yes. and falsehood, is Putin. He said, when the people yeah. doesn't know any longer what's true, what's false, you've won. And yes, I agree. It's a project of blurring, not of, of telling downright lies, no, not of trying to persuade people to believe in lies, but of, of, of blurring to, uh, to destroy uh, truth norms, the very idea of being obligated to tell the truth. So there's, there's a little story to be, to be told about this ways of propaganda and manipulation, which is blurring the border between truth and false. And it started with uh, one uh, person around Putin and it spread uh, through Steve Bannon and others in the States mm -hmm. saying we, our aim is to destroy any creed in, in truthfulness. Um, and this now is, is, is a point of debate and it's quite important to uh, address this question of truth and rehabilitate the notion of truth. Um, and, and yes. I'm quite confident that societies are doing the work. Societies, I mean, uh, at large. <laughs> uh, people in societies believe that it's important to, re to restore the sense of truth. Yeah. Truth lasts longer, as they say. Truth lasts longer. Very yes. good. Very good. Yeah. Perhaps uh, those are good words uh, to, uh, to conclude uh, our conversation. Uh, it's it's been a pleasure. Good. I think uh, I hope to. Um, we can perhaps uh, have another conversation some other time. I could uh, interview yeah, I you to, to my newspaper. Will, I hope yeah. democracy will still exist then. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm certainly. Sure, certainly. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Nils.